A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, my guest is A.J. Jacobs, author, journalist, lecturer, and human guinea pig. A.J. has written four New York Times bestsellers. His writing combines memoir, science, humor, and a dash of self-help. A.J. has written a book called The Year of Living Biblically. This is a genre, immersion journalism, which has also been called stunt journalism, where he goes deep into a particular topic or experience, and then writes about it sometimes for years, having read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, having read and lived as best he could, all of the commandments in the Bible, having been very healthy, written a book 1,200 miles at a walking treadmill desk. Jacobs writes for the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, New York Magazine, Dental Economics, and has been, or maybe still is, an editor at Esquire magazine. He's appeared on Oprah, The Today Show, Good Morning America, CNN, The Dr. Oz Show, Conan, and The Colbert Report. So you get he's a successful writer, but he's also a fantastic human being. His most recent book, and the one that we explore most in this interview, is Thanks a Thousand, A Gratitude Journey, where he endeavors to thank everyone who is involved in making his morning cup of coffee uh, possible. And it's also something you can see a TED Talk that he has done. Very funny, very thought-provoking in some ways. And now that I'm recording this intro, I'm not sure how I neglected to bring this up in the interview, but in some ways, really kind of a Buddhist perspective. But I won't steal all of that from you. You can read the book and see what I mean. Very insightful. In this, we also talk about his creative process. We talk about how he chooses the topics that he devotes years of his life to. We talk about how he finishes. It's one thing to have a lot of ideas, but to actually get them over the finish line and have them be good. AJ talks about how he does that. And we also talk about surgery without anesthesia. So I hope that you enjoy this interview. I think you will. And I believe that you will take away at least one thing that will improve the quality of your life and help you to make a contribution to others. So please enjoy this conversation with AJ Jacobs. AJ, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you, Brian. It is a delight to be here. AJ, will you tell me, please, what's life about? I know that you start every interview, so I was prepared for this. I even wrote, I wrote a a bad joke, but I decided not to use, which is... Oh, come on. You got to use it now. (laughs) I'll I'll tell it to you, but it's in brackets as something I would not, I was going to say, that's about 78 years if you're an average American. (laughs) So, uh, but but I think it's about, uh, to me, trying to uh, get as much well-being as you can, uh, achieve happiness, but not just for yourself, for others as well. And the the good thing uh, to me is that they are interlinked, that you can't be really happy if you're just focused on yourself. And the way is to help others. Yeah, that's somewhat of a paradox, I think, where it seems a little counterintuitive to think that the more you focus on yourself, the less happy you would be. But that's certainly true in my experience and the people that I coach. Yeah, it is a paradox. It's a delightful paradox. Uh, but I agree, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but the more you do focus on your own happiness, you become less happy, I find. And I, for, I'd for i say the first 35 years was very self-obsessed and self-focused. Maybe I still am. But uh, I've improved 
And I think that's made me a happier person. It's interesting to me that you mentioned age 35 because that was that exact year was a pivotal point in my life as well. What what happened for you to change your focus at the age of 35 or around that time? A constant accumulation of tiny little shards of wisdom. And eventually you become a little wiser. But I never had the road to Damascus moment where I'm like, oh, I'm a selfish bastard. Uh, I should... Uh, <laughs> I should start to think of other people. What about you, though? I know you had an interesting, you had a talk with a rabbi, I believe. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, man. So the short, you know, somebody once told me, you know how you make a long story short, you don't tell it. <laughs> but since you asked, you know, for me, it was, a, it was a case of, I think it was, it probably wasn't my midlife, somewhere between my quarter life and midlife crisis of where, you know, a lot of things combined in my life. To where I was experiencing a lot of unhappiness hmm. and unworkability, and I was ignorant enough that I didn't recognize that I was the common denominator, right? The problem was always <laughs> out there. But between, you know, being in a job that I didn't love, my dad having died, having a son who was born 14 weeks prematurely at hmm. two pounds, spending nine months in the NICU, and on top of it being in a marriage that ultimately for me wasn't fulfilling, uh, it was just my life crucible to where I said, like, what am I doing on this planet? Mm. You know, and and how many more years of this do I do I want to endure? And it was in that moment that I really was looking for answers, you know, anywhere and everywhere, and was fortunate to cross paths with with Rabbi Benny Zippel here in, in Salt Lake and one conversation changed my whole life. Wow. Can I just ask what was it? I know that uh, you can't make <laughs> a long story short, especially one about something that changed your life drastically, but yeah. what was it that, was it a sentence he said? Was it yeah. a, a paragraph? Yeah. What did he say that made yeah. you ha see the light? So what it was, was, well, he started by, you know, inviting me in, we sat down, he's very, very fatherly, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and again, this was a time after my dad had passed and, and when he just asked me to share, he's, you know, like what's going on. And I told him, and he, he then invited me and he just listened and he, he didn't diagnose anything. He didn't prescribe anything, you know, in that moment. And, uh, he, he invited me to do this little thought experiment and I sometimes use it now when I speak. So I suppose anyone listening gets a chance to, to follow along right now, but, and, and I just want to interject. I'm going to go sideways for a moment to say, AJ, I loved when you hosted Tim Ferriss's podcast. <laughs> when, when you well, got thank to you. guest host. And I'm feeling a little bit now like I'm the guest on my own podcast. So <laughs> maybe you've got this talent. Uh, my pleasure. Well, I love hearing your story. I've heard mine, so yeah. I don't need to hear it again, but I'm I'm fascinated with yours. Well, well, thank uh, you. So, okay. So here's how it goes. So I'm sitting across the desk. I'm in, in, in Rabbi Zippel's office and he's listened to this long, sad story of which I am the subject, the victim. Of course, I'm the victim of my own life's choices. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet he's kind enough to not point that out to me. Uh, and instead, he just says, Brian, I want you to try something. And I said, okay. And he said, close your eyes. Now, of course, for people driving, this doesn't work. <laughs> so don't do that. <laughs> but he said, close your eyes. And I, and I want you to imagine the seven and a half billion people on earth and I want you to picture in your mind's eye as best you can all of the activity that's occurring. All these people going about their lives, people being born, people dying, you know, Times Square is bustling, like whatever is happening is, is all happening right now. And he said, can you picture? And I said, yeah, I can see it. You know, planes taking off and reunions happening and birthday parties, all that. And he said, okay, now that you've got that image in your mind, what I want you to do is picture that you are the one element missing like you're you're absent can you feel the difference can you feel it and i said nope <laughs> not at all not one bit and he said and I, I feel myself as i retell this you know being emotional just re-experiencing it and remembering it and he said that's your problem he's like all that stuff you told me that's not your problem your problem is you can't feel the difference that you can make here on earth and until you find and live your purpose and you're congruent with, with why you're here, nothing you do will fulfill you. And, 
And in that moment, you know, I say this sometimes when I share that is it feels to me a little bit like that scene in Tommy Boy where, you know, Dan Aykroyd tells him like that scent, that horrible scent, you know, and he's like, well, the first step is pinpointing it, but now you got to get rid of it. So it's like it didn't help that he pointed it out when he stopped short of telling me what it was. But he said, I don't know what it is. Only you can figure it out and you got to find it and live it. And so I left that office determined to find and live my purpose. And ever since then, you know, life has been, it's not like it's all been sunshine and rainbows, but a constant exploration to more deeply understand and live true to that. It's really, I guess you could say the wonderful life exercise, right? Yeah, George there Bailey. you go. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting because I have a file that I keep uh, called One Thing. And after every conversation or dinner or podcast or TV show, I try to write down one thing to remember. Oh. So that will be my one thing. And oh. listen, if other uh, listeners, I, I love this one thing because if you don't remember one thing, you remember nothing. If you try to remember more than one thing, often it, it, you, you just get a blur. So I'm a big fan of the one thing idea. Um, and I will not be offended if uh, any and all listeners do this and make that their one thing from this podcast instead of anything I say. Well, right on. That's that's really beautiful. I, I appreciate that. I, I'm going to adopt that practice at least for a little while, see how it works in my life. Oh, yeah. Okay. Give it a shot. It is amazing. Uh, I mean, one of my I look at it every few days. Uh, I remember I was listening to a podcast about Michelangelo, and the one thing I remember from that is that he did not want to paint the Sistine Chapel. The Pope kind of made him, and he was he wrote letters to his friends about how insecure he was as a painter because he thought of himself as a sculptor and that he was doing a terrible job and this was such a disaster. And, uh, you know... The, he he created one of the greatest works of Western civilization. So if he was having self doubt, I think it's okay for us to have self doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so AJ, I want to turn the questions back to you. Okay, <laughs> if that's I'm okay, ready. with sure. your permission. Okay, mm-hmm. awesome. Granted. So now you've written a lot. But when I asked if you would be on, and by the way, I imagine you've probably estimated this in your lifetime. How many words would you estimate you have composed? That is a very good question. I think I've topped a million, but that but that includes emails. So, uh, uh, but I know that my books are about a hundred thousand words each if you average them out. Yeah. So, and I've written about six or seven. So. Awesome. So when I asked if you would be a guest on this show, it was because I specifically wanted to ask you about Thanks a Thousand, your most recent book. And for anybody who doesn't know this book, you might start with the TED Talk. Um, that's what I would recommend. Maybe you'd say something else, AJ. Nope, that's great. Yeah, it's such a it's such a fun concept. Um But rather than me try to articulate, let me ask you this, AJ. Will you tell me, with this book, Thanks a Thousand, A Gratitude Journey, who did you write this book for and why? Uh, Yeah, well, I'm happy to tell you sort of the origin story. Uh, And it was that I knew intellectually how important gratitude is. Uh, There are all these studies about how it's linked to happiness, to health, to better sleep, you name it. and uh, so I, I decided to do this gratitude practice, this ritual. Before every meal, I would say a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, but the trick is, I'm not very religious. So I decided instead of thanking God, because I'm agnostic, why not thank some of the people who helped make my meal uh, a reality? So I would before a meal, say, uh, let's thank the farmer who grew these tomatoes and the cashier who sold these tomatoes to us. And my son, who was about 11 at the time, said, you know, Dad, that's it's fine, but it's also pretty lame because these people, they can't hear you. They're not getting anything out of it. They're not in our apartment. If you really cared, you would go and thank him in person. And I sort of had that light bulb like, 
that is a lovely idea for a book. He just gave me a book idea. So he earned his supper, and it turned out to be a lovely idea. Major pain in the ass, but a, a lovely idea because uh, I decided to focus on one food to make it simpler, uh, which was coffee, which I can't live without. And I decided to thank everyone who helped make that morning cup of coffee I buy at this coffee shop around the corner, I, a reality. And I took it wide. So I, t I had to thank, it turned out to be over a thousand people uh, because I had to thank the farmers. I went to South America and thanked them. I thanked the Sure. Um, I thanked the barista. But there's also the logo designer. There's the truck driver who drove the coffee beans to the store. There's the person who painted the yellow lines in the street so the truck wouldn't go into traffic and smash and uh, and prevent my coffee beans from arriving. So it was, um, once you start to think about it, there are literally thousands of people responsible for every little thing in our lives. The architects, designers, biologists, uh, yeah, people in transportation, government employees. It just goes on and on. So it took me a long time and I traveled a, a whole bunch, but uh, it was overall a lovely experiment and helped me realize all the hundreds of things that go right every day instead of focusing on the three or four that go wrong. Yeah, which is so easy to do and, and so natural. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. And, and one thing you said early in the book, uh, you say, I'd estimate that in my default mode, <laughs> I'm mildly to severely aggravated more than 50% of my waking hours. <laughs> Would you <laughs> yeah, say, think, uh, is that still true? I've gotten it down to about 40, 45%. So uh, I feel that's a big victory and I'll keep fighting to get it lower. But I talk about in the book, we all have our uh, our two sides, sort of the uh, the Larry David side and the Mr. Rogers side. So the Larry David side, the cynical, pessimistic, noticing what goes wrong. And then the Mr. Rogers, which is looking on the bright side. And I, you know, I think I was born with quite a strong Larry David side. And I also, I like to watch the Larry David, I'd rather watch the Larry David show than Mr. Rogers, but I don't want to live it. It's just yeah. not a fun place to be mentally. So uh, I felt uh, that I try to get rid of this this bias towards negativity that I think all humans are born with. It had evolutionary uh, usage way back when, when we were on the savanna. It was good to be paranoid uh, so you wouldn't get eaten by a tiger. But now it just uh, it, it just makes our life worse and causes anxiety and depression. So I've, I've really been uh, hard at work to try to get, minimize the negative bias. Uh, and again, it's like, it, it doesn't come naturally. I have to do it every day. I have to do practice this every day. I have to thank people excessively. I, I don't go to South America and thank them anymore, but I still try to write notes, um, and uh, and I still try to uh, say at night I'll do a ritual where when I'm falling asleep, instead of uh, counting sheep, I'll go through the alphabet and count, say something that I'm grateful for, for every letter. And it gives it a nice structure. So like A, I'm grateful for the apple pancakes my kids made uh, over the weekend. Or B, I'm grateful for the TV show Barry uh, on HBO with Henry Winkler. And every letter yields something to be grateful for. So it's those kinds of daily rituals that I feel I need to uh, keep myself from descending back into that negative bias. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. And my wife and I adopted something a couple years ago along those same lines. We don't necessarily go through the alphabet as much as we love the alphabet. We, <laughs> but what doesn't? we do is we, we take a moment before 
I'm going to make a confession because we have we actually have a multi part bedtime ritual. We we like to go to bed together at the same mm-hmm. time, and uh, and one of the things we do here's the nerd like the super learning nerd personal growth self improvement junkie in me that <laughs> we actually have a couple's affirmation mm. that, that we say together. And it, so I'm I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I barely admit it. But after that, we then go through what are we grateful for from that day. And mm. what I've learned is it's such a fun way to connect because we, even though we were together, you know, maybe at dinner or whatever, we didn't recap our day. And mm. by just focusing on that highlight, it's a fun way to change our focus, get in a beautiful state, and then also just share a little bit of each other's experience. It's it's really a, it, it is an amazing um, thing. That's a lovely ritual. Yeah, I like that. Maybe I'll try it. The problem is my wife goes to bed at 10 and I go to bed at like 1.30. So oh, yeah. it might be, I don't want to wake her up. That wouldn't help. Yeah, that, that would have perhaps the opposite intended effect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I love, I think I came across it on LinkedIn. Of course, the, this book contains many strategies as well. But I think I came across something you wrote that was a list, strategy one through 10 of things that we can do to experience more gratitude in our lives. One that didn't make the list per se, not this way, although there's maybe a version of it here. You say surgery without anesthesia. Mm, That (laughs) is true. (laughs) Will you talk about that? Why do you say that? And what, what do you mean by it? Yeah, that is sort of a mantra that when I am feeling particularly annoyed or depressed, I do try to say that out loud to myself, surgery without anesthesia. And basically, I'm reminding myself of what life was like 100, 200 years ago, and it was hard. Uh, You know, we have a lot of problems now, and I don't want to minimize those, but we should be incredibly grateful that we live when we do, uh, because the good old days were not good. The good old days were terrible. They they were just, they were disease ridden. They were smelly. They were sexist and homophobic and violent. uh, At least if you believe Steven Pinker, the Harvard psychologist, he writes about how we live in the least violent times, even though even even though people don't believe it. Yeah, in that book, but the better angels of our nature changed my my perspective of the world for sure. Oh, lovely. Me too. I'm a fan. Um, So yeah, and and uh, when I was researching one one of my books, I ran across this description, a first person description of a woman who had to undergo surgery before there was anesthesia, and it was just so horrible. I mean, these, back uh, in the 1700s, surgeons, you wouldn't make an appointment. They would just show up at your door. They'd say, we'll be there sometime this week, because uh, it turned out if they made an appointment, people would commit suicide before the surgery, because it was just so hard. Allegedly, I read it in uh, a... uh, 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 authoritative source uh so allegedly but um but yeah it is uh it was just it was just horrible and again we have huge problems now maybe some of the like climate change is you know that is a worldwide problem but but we shouldn't feel helpless that the world just keeps getting worse and worse because it doesn't a lot of parts of the world have gotten incredibly better yeah Absolutely. And our own ability to shift, not to dismiss or pretend they don't exist, you know, problems and these these challenges that we face individually or as a society, but the power that we have to create our own experience within, mm. you know, the world. And this was something I was almost entirely oblivious to, you know, for those first 35 years of my <laughs> life before my conversation with the rabbi. But then what I realized is even after we we come to an awareness then the work begins because then it's responsibility and choice and doing it even if we don't feel like it or not, right? Mm. Like nobody makes us remember to say surgery without anesthesia every time <laughs> Apple releases a new update for my, you know, for our phones or whatever, but <laughs> but we can. Right. It is, as you say, it's, it's a discipline uh, and it is uh, that uh, to me uh, – it's like I'm not very good at going to the gym. I do still. I walk on my treadmill a lot. I write. I write and email on my treadmill, um, but uh, but I do understand the importance of 
uh, rituals. And uh, even though I don't go to the gym, I feel I go to the mental gym a lot. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Tell me with, um, do you ever, like one of the things that I find, because I do teach principles related to gratitude in, in the coaching that I do, uh, recognizing it is kind of like a super emotion or as, you know, we've heard, you know, the key, the parent of life, was that Cicero? Gratitude mm. is the key. Right. right. The, in, in the, all this. Um, the, the primary virtue, maybe. Right. I think something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. But one thing that I've discovered in my research and in my experience is sometimes gratitude exists for me only as an intellectual exercise, and it doesn't necessarily exist as an experiential. And in fact, sometimes I feel like crap when I try to make myself be grateful because then I don't feel grateful. And I wonder if you ever have a similar kind of experience, like there's a difference between thinking grateful and being great, like feeling grateful and does it ever kind of work in in the in the inverse for you? I do. I do know what you're talking about, and I feel one way to battle that is to make it more outward facing. So you're not just counting your what you're thankful for. You're going out and thanking people um, or writing thank you notes. That makes it more concrete and emotional for me. So, for instance. Uh, I would wake up during this year, I would wake this project of thanking a thousand people. I might wake up with my default grumpy state, but I would force myself to spend a couple hours writing notes to people and calling them. And eventually the actions uh, uh, forced my mind to catch up. Uh, and that's been a big theme in, in all of my books is how much your behavior affects your thoughts. Yeah. And there's a great quote that I wish I had come up with, but I didn't. It was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. He said, um, uh, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. So act as if you're grateful, act as if you're optimistic, and eventually your brain catches up. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I... I, I think about something that I once heard, you know, the spiritual teacher Osho said, I, I love, and he was talking about, um, he's talking about being wise or being, achieving enlightenment. And, and he said something along the lines of, at first, it will seem only as if mm. you are, you know, but with time. And it was like, that's so, so beautiful. But That yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I hadn't heard that from, <laughs> I've heard it. Uh, I mean, C.S. Lewis talks about it. And um, so, uh, and uh, and I know Teddy Roosevelt talked about someone once asked him how how did you uh, how are you so brave? And he said, "I'm not. I just pretend that I'm brave, uh, and eventually I become a little more brave." So uh, it's a theme throughout all of these uh, wise people. Uh, yeah. and, uh, east east so and west cool. confirmed on both hemispheres. There you go. It <laughs> must be true. true. <laughs> Absolutely. So how did writing this book, assuming it did, how did writing this book change your life? Uh, well, it has made me happier and more grateful. And uh, But again, I have to work at it. I feel it's always, it's, it's not that I can rest on my laurels, but it gave me some of the tools and habits to become more grateful. Um, and also another thing that I liked uh, was to market the book. I decided, I, I announced I would write a thousand thank you notes to readers of my books. So they would just go on my website and fill in their name and address and maybe a little something about them. And then I would write a thank you letter to them. Wow. And just doing that was quite, again, Huge pain in the ass. I didn't realize how big a thousand letters is. Uh, That's a but, lot of stamps. There's a lot of stamps. Yeah, it was not uh, economically my best move, but it was uh, it was quite lovely because I got to uh, I not only got to you know feel hear from people, uh, but I I heard what parts of my books resonated with them, and I got to know a little about their lives, and uh, you know I got to. Uh, see their sense of humor. Like one, they they asked me. A lot of them asked me to draw 
which I'm not not my specialty. They'd say, draw a dog or a taco. (laughs) That seems pretty random. It was totally random. Uh, But I would do it, you know. I'm like, listen... That's uh, if that'll make you happy. I, I actually I was proud of myself. I went above and beyond and drew a dog eating a taco. Oh, there you so, go. So hopefully they were happy. <laughs> uh, but it's been yeah, it's been great. And and actually it has helped me from a selfish point of view because people will tweet about it or post on Instagram the letter I wrote. And so it's sort of like, you know, uh, 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 giving me a little boost as well. That's awesome. That, that's fun. So, okay, I want to in, I want to ask one more question before yes. we shift to the enlightening lightning round. But okay, so two questions. The first question is about humor. It's about your humor, AJ, because part of what I love about this book is that it, it and and I love about your TED Talk and just talking with you now is that it comes through. Like the book is fun, it's it's interesting, it's it's creative and And I get the sense that there's, I mean, a real, obviously, a personality there that's authentic and it's coming through on the page. But in your experience as a writer, like how much of that is you just expressing yourself naturally and how much is something that you've consciously cultivated? Hmm. That's a great question. And I don't know if I have the answer, um, partly because like... Like we just discussed, sort of you act your way into a new way of thinking. So if I if I started writing and, and trying to uh, make it as entertaining as possible, eventually I grew into that. So I'm um, but I do love it. I think that it's a way to get across a message without being too preachy. And uh, so I do try to make it humorous. Not everyone loves all of my uh, my humor, but I'll, I, I'm happy that some people seem to. And uh, yeah, it's it's just a way like, you know, uh, a friend of mine talks about you, know, you got to give them uh, like popcorn and bubble gum in addition to the broccoli. Uh, although bubble gum and broccoli, that sounds like a bad combination. So. I, I think he needs to revise that. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, and there's lots of studies that when people are in good moods, they are more creative. They are, they are better at learning. So um, for me, uh, and I think about this a lot because I'm involved with this philanthropic group, and uh, making people feel guilty is one way to get them to give money. But I actually don't think it's the most effective way, and yeah. I think it shuts them down. So in terms of motivation, making people feel good, just the, sort of the positive, as the, the carrot as opposed to the stick, I think is more effective. Yeah, I, I think you're right. In fact, I know Tim Ferriss just put a, in a quote in a, a recent uh, Five Bullet Friday about no man has ever been shamed out of his sins or something like that. Mm, you there know? you go. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think that's true. <clears throat> so, okay. Last gratitude related question for now is just this. I love the connection that you made. I wouldn't have made this myself, I don't think, but you talk about, you say in the book, you can't be grateful if your attention is scattered. Mm. Right. And you'd written an article on I found on LinkedIn that I thought was great about what you called unitasking. I'd never heard, of course I've heard of you know multitasking. I'd never heard of unitasking, <laughs> but I just wondered what your experience was there with this idea of being present or being focused on a single thing and how that might relate to, you know, the experience of gratitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's absolutely key. And I do uh, I once wrote an article on unitasking where I tried all these methods to focus as much as possible. And uh, I think it's a prerequisite for everything. It's a prerequisite for for being grateful because you can't know, notice what to be thankful for. Um, but it's also a prerequisite for, for thinking uh, and, and for relationships and you know, once I started to pay attention to how much I multitasked, it was kind of a revelation. And and doing something like even talking on the phone now, I try to talk on the phone with my mom, force myself 
just to talk on the phone, which, you know, I didn't do for many years. I was looking at my email. I was cleaning up. I was doing something else. But I like if you force yourself to actually close your eyes and focus on the conversation, you, you know, it changes the level of the conversation. You actually can exchange ideas. It's really remarkable. So I've, uh, I've become a fan of unitasking or monotasking. I'm not sure which has caught on, if either. Yeah. Well, you can claim, claim them both. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. No, I thought it was great because I, I, I was reading the comments of the LinkedIn article that you wrote, <clears throat> and one of the people said, I Googled unitasking, and it led me here. And I was like, holy crap. People no are way. looking for that. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's awesome. fantastic. I did not know <clears throat> that. Yeah. It was well, pretty thank cool. you. Yeah. So, okay. Then <clears throat> I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me. No problem. <laughs> okay. I want to transition us now to the enlightening lightning round. Great. So, this is a series of relatively short questions. You're free to answer as long as you like, but I'm going to work to keep myself out of it with Maybe a couple exceptions. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Uh, question number one. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... <laughs> uh, mixed metaphor. How's that? Because I think... <laughs> I, mean, I tried to go meta because I think uh, it's life is so complicated, you can't just compare it to one thing. It's, it is like a box of chocolates, but it's also like a rose. It's got thorns and flowers. It's also like a roller coaster ride. It's also like um, a quest. So there's no way to reduce life to one analogy. Um, by the way, my kids object to the box of chocolates thing because at least nowadays, they give you the little map of what oh, everything is. So yes. you do know what you're getting. So there you go. Tell the Forrest Gump that. <laughs> I wonder if the internet is also our life's metaphoric box of chocolates. Oh. Map. Yeah, maybe. Although it's it's a very inaccurate map and leads us down dangerous alleys. Yeah, but, for uh, sure. but, but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Question number two. What's something at which you wish you were better? Oof, uh, that is, uh, I'd say everything. Uh, I mean, my life has been a lot about trying uh, sort of the genre of self-improvement, but also other improvement. I don't like solely self-improvement, as I said at the beginning. Self-improvement really is intertwined with other improvement. But I feel that uh, it's important to just keep on trying to make yourself and the world better. Um, but let me think of something specific. Uh, well, how's this? I um, My next book is about puzzles and riddles and problem solving and whether thinking like a puzzler can help make us better thinkers and, and citizens. So I went this past weekend, I just got back yesterday, uh, my family and I went to the International Jigsaw Puzzle Championships in Spain. No we were represent way. Yes. Yes, sir. No way. I, AJ, I, I want to jump in. I finished a 9,000-piece puzzle. No it, way. And it changed my life, and I'm in the middle of a 5,000-piece puzzle right now. Ooh, I want to talk about that. Amazing. Anyway, so I, I, want to, I didn't know there was a championship, though. Holy cow. Well, you would have done better than me. My, I disgraced our country, I'm afraid. Oh, you, I, you participated. Oh, yeah. No, I was a Team USA, me and my okay, family. So, so how does it work? Walk us through it. Well, you get to there, and it's in a small town in Spain, and it's in this arena, and there are 42 countries represented from Uganda to um, Japan to Mexico, and you're giving, for the team event, it's four people on a team, and you're given four box jigsaw puzzles that have never been published before, and did you have? Given, did, did you have to qualify? I qualified by filling out a form. Okay. And sending in. <laughs> you know, Count it. Well, Count it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> but I got to say, I'm representing the United States, and it nice. sounded impressive. Uh, but yeah, and then you have eight hours to finish these four puzzles that are between one and two thousand pieces, wow. and it was remarkable because, like, 
you know, we finished one and a half, uh, but the like the Russian team, the Russians, and I'm not accusing them of doping or anything, but <laughs> they were like crazy. It was less it was three and a half hours they were finished with them all. No and you would way. watch their hands. It was like watching double speed video. Wow. It was in real speed. They were wow. just and they they specialized, like each had a specialized role. One was a sorter. One was good at like the monocolor sky part. Uh, so that is that is part of their secret. And they practice. They practice like three times a week for months for wow. this competition. That is unbelievable. That, that was fun. I can't. So will you come back on this show when you when you launch this book? I would love to, and I want to hear about your puzzle experience. Oh my uh, gosh! No, I, I, in fact, I almost showed you this at the beginning of our interview. My mom, I, I actually, I'm such a nerd. I have a puzzle carrier that I take <laughs> my puzzles in process places. And I, on a Sunday night, I went to my mom's house and I took a puzzle and I lost a piece there, which she later found, mm. and she brought it back to me because we work in the same office. I have it in my hand today, a piece I've been missing for months. No way. <laughs> I finally got it back today. Like, it's so random. That is weird. And yeah. what's the puzzle that that piece belongs to? This is a, it's one of Ravensburger's. It's a, it's a 1500, I believe it's a 1500 piece. It's an African scene. And huh. this is a piece of the grass just below the, the zebras. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, they were the ones who sponsored the tournament. So these are oh, all Ravensburger. Yeah. I love At, their, their puzzles. And well, can I ask you, you, you can edit it out if you don't want <laughs> sure. to go on, but, but how did, tell me about finishing that 9,000 and how it changed your life. Oh man. Well, what, what I thought about a lot was the, the monks who would copy manuscripts by hand for years. Mm, right. You know? And, and so I have this process that I followed where, and I'm always looking for a more efficient way. So I'd love to know more about how the tournament worked and what strategy people use. But what, what I did was I take all the pieces after a certain point, after I get the border and then the colors. And then what I do is I sort every shape, every shape type. Mm. And there's only, I believe, six different shape types. And then I arrange them all so that they're in rows so I can easily scan them. Mm. And, and with that, the discipline, like just the patience of, you know, and the perseverance, it took me 22 months to complete this wow. puzzle. But, and I didn't work on it every day. But having that commitment and that and and being very routine and very methodical, it actually helped me to complete my first um, complete manuscript where I've now written a hundred and eight thousand word manuscript, which I don't think I would have been able to do if I hadn't had the experience with the puzzle. I love it. That is so interesting. And that is a strategy that some of the real champions use is, mm. yeah, like you separate out the ones with, three outies and one any and then yep. two uh, and put them in a line exactly so you uh you definitely could compete what was <laughs> the what was the the theme of that puzzle this was the, this was an underwater scene so coral underwater. and fish and lots and lots of blue <laughs> it's, yeah, it's beautiful i've actually i glued it and it's now framed and hanging in the uh, in the hallway in my basement leading to my puzzle room <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, next year you have to go. You that definitely, sounds amazing. Yeah, I'll send you the info. Yeah, that's you would great. love it. Yeah, I would. And and I heard you say that it also includes um, riddles. That that you that your book includes riddles. Yeah, I'm gonna have a, a chapter on riddles and crossword puzzles, and uh, I, you know, I just love it. And and the thesis is. Uh, I believe the world would be better if we if we saw everything as a puzzle to be solved as opposed to a war to be fought. Because, mm. you know, you can sort of see, uh, and there are elements of both in our world, but, but if, you, uh, if you focus too much on that it's a, a war, a conflict, yep. and that people are out to get you, that might not be the most productive way. Instead, seeing big problems as a puzzle, like the climate as a puzzle, like how can we fix this by working together as opposed to, um, you know, seeing this this one is the enemy and yep. we have to defeat it. Yeah, and it's in a zero sum. 
world, mm. right? And and what exactly. I love about that metaphor too is I, it makes me think of something. Uh, another guest on this show, Paul Hawken, the climate scientist and an author and activist, said he said that human beings are the only species that discard members of their own species. Mm. And he and and I love the puzzle metaphor because everything has a place. Everything fits together. Mm, that's you interesting. Know? No, yeah. nothing is left out. It's like that's really right. cool. And when he said discard, meaning like put him in jail, or what was he referring to? Yeah, talking about homelessness, talking about people who who are incarcerated. You know, people Got that it. we just kind of forget and 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 minimize. You know, marginalize. I see. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it came up in a discussion of I don't remember if it was capitalism or we were asking about anyway. This AJ, this <laughs> I'm so okay. I want to ask how. I want to ask about a, a riddle, and and this is not how the the enlightening lightning round normally goes. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> but that one answer was like holy crap. Okay, so before we get back on track, I just want to ask: Have you? What is your favorite riddle so far? Hmm, that is a great question, uh, and I wish I had a better answer. Uh, I remember. You know what? Give me a second. Maybe you can edit this out. But let me go on my computer to my riddle section because there are some very interesting ones. Uh, the fir- One of the first riddles was by Samson in the Bible. And it was actually, I thought, a very unfair riddle. You know, there are fair riddles and there are unfair riddles. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. Let me give you... Well, there's the classic one, the, the riddle of the Sphinx. Yep. Uh, that's fine. But uh, there's got to be one that's better. How about... <laughs> well, this was interesting. This was like a riddle from, uh, from the Middle Ages. So this shows that people had dirty minds even back uh, centuries ago. Because this is, uh, you ready? It goes, I am a wonderful help to women, the hope of something to come. I harm no citizen except my slayer. Rooted I stand on a high bed. I am shaggy below, sometimes the beautiful peasant's daughter. An eager, armed, proud woman grabs my body, rushes my red skin, holds me hard, claims my head. The curly-haired woman who catches me fast will feel our meeting. Her eye will be wet. So it sounds quite dirty. It sounds like, you know, yeah, uh, a penis is the, what they're making, you think. But the answer is an onion. Uh, it makes, <laughs> so you, it's got like the, uh, the curly roots and you grab it and, uh, and then your eye will be wet from crying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So uh, I did like... That yeah, we we did not invent raunchy humor. How have I never heard that riddle before? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's not it's not one that rolls off the tongue. No, you know, I wonder if you found this one. I don't know who who you know originated it, but this riddle of what is greater than God and worse than the devil mm. is: poor men have it, rich men need it, dead men eat it. But if you eat it, you will die. Mm. I love those both, but. What is it? I, I, you really want me just to tell you? <laughs> All right, well, say it again. I'll, okay. I'll try so, to figure. okay. So, what is greater than God? Yeah. And worse than the devil? Yeah. Uh, poor men have it, rich men need it, dead men eat it, but if you eat it, you will die. <sighs> I, don't know. I was going to say something like time, but that doesn't work for all of them. Um, then I was going to go meta and say something about the words because, uh, you know, maybe they're greater than, they're, they're more letters than God. Oh, but no, I am going to, I would, uh, okay. I, I need I'll to g- know. I'll I give you a clue know. if you want. Okay, sure. So, so I heard you say you're agnostic, but I think this can still work. But, and this is, this is representative of solving complex problems sometimes, right? Like you break it down into its parts and take them one at a time. Yes. So, so starting at the beginning, what is greater than God? Greater than God. Many gods. Okay. That's a valid answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the universe. No. Well, Most not, people. Oh, I guess nothing. Nothing is greater than bam. God. Bam. There it is. There All you right. go. And then it meets the other five conditions. Isn't that fun? 
that is good. I like that a lot. Ah, okay. So I'm going to include that. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And I love that. I love that riddle. So, okay. Very cool. Well, that I'm, Geez, AJ, I don't remember the last time I had this much fun doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm having a lovely time, too. Well, thank you. So, okay, so I'm going to keep us moving through the lightning round, if that's okay with you. Of course. Okay, question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a T-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Mm, that's an interesting one. I would say... Well, it's the T-shirt uh, that I wore yesterday, I think, and it's called, uh, it's a group that I belong to called Effective Altruism, and it's a picture of a, uh, the logo is a light bulb with a heart, sort of the wiring inside is a heart, because it's the idea to combine compassion and rationality. So it's a group that tries to figure out how best to... Um, if we're going to help the world, how can we do that most efficiently given our resources? So uh, it, it's a lovely organization. And uh, I don't know if you have you heard of uh, effective altruism at all? No, you, no, I'm not oh, familiar. Uh, well, and there's another uh, affiliated group called Give Well, which ranks charities and they really do like return on investment. They really try to figure out which charities. So anyway, I'm a big fan of that. So if I'm going to wear something, I might as uh, uh, advertise my little tribe. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Okay, sure. question number four. What book, other than one of your own, have you gifted <laughs> or recommended most often? Hmm. Uh, well, we do give this one book as a baby book to where you can order it and it spells out the name of the baby and you know so it, uh it would have uh, a z for zebra uh i'm a zebra if there's a z in the name and an aardvark if there's an a and uh since everyone loves their own name that has been a very successful gift awesome what if people want to find it and maybe give that gift to their loved ones as well how can they do it what's it called do you know I can't remember it, but it's, I think it's on the site Red Envelope. Red Envelope. Okay, cool. And the alphabet is emerging as a theme in this interview. <laughs> I am a fan. <laughs> okay. All right. Question number five. So you travel a ton. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel, to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Uh, another excellent question. I would say... Um, I don't mind travel. I used to mind it, but now that they let you look at your phone during takeoff, like I have 400 books on Kindle, but then I'm dying to read, which is an obscene amount, but I just can't resist when I see a good book. Um, I can't resist buying it. So, uh, so to me, that is just the biggest hack is put I, oh and the second hack is i used to have these um noise canceling headphones mm. uh which are great but they cost three hundred dollars and i kept losing them and i just wow. couldn't afford it anymore so i have these headphones now and i can send you the link if you want to include it in the show notes or something but they are nine dollars and 85 cents no way they're not they're not electric, but they do a great job of muffling the sound. So I just pop those on and I read my book and uh, it's not so bad. Wow. That, that sounds great. I, I would like to, to include that link if you'd be willing to send it. Of course. It's Walker's earphones, but I'll send you the link. Oh, okay. I, and I can find it too, so you don't need to worry about it. But thank you for that. Of course. All right. Number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Hmm, that is a good question. I guess I have, um, well, I've stopped trying to focus on the negative. That's one thing. Uh, I have stopped, uh, well, one thing is I used to feel, I, I love crossword puzzles, so I did them every night. And I used to feel guilty about it because I'm like, you know, I should be helping my kids. I should be... <laughs> doing the dishes, but I feel it's okay. When I finally gave myself permission to 
to do the crossword puzzle and feel okay about it. Because you do, it, it's important, you know, the whole idea of self-care. It's important yeah. to be healthy, uh, you know, take vacations. It makes you a better person. It makes you more efficient in the long run. So giving myself, not beating myself up for doing the crossword puzzle. And now, weirdly, it's my job since I'm writing a book about puzzles. So yeah. now I definitely don't feel guilty. No, that's great. And as I've read, um, also helps stave off Alzheimer's and mm. dementia and other things. Exactly. There's like there's some evidence. Who knows if it's true? But I like oh. uh, I like to. Uh, it, it makes you feel better regardless. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? I wish every American knew how to distinguish between truth and fiction. And I include myself in that because it's a very difficult task, but one we really need to uh, master because I think we are in a crisis right now, this post-truth crisis. And we need to get training in what's what's an authoritative source, how do we interpret science, how... Um, you know, who to believe, how to make your liars and bullshit artists. So uh, it's it's hard, but it's so important. Okay. And and I just want to explore this with you too, AJ. I, I think it's pretty remarkable that we live in a, a day and age where if you look at an image or you hear something, you can't know. Like, it's almost an implicit assumption that it it's been doctored or enhanced modified in some way like we school kids grow up knowing you can, you don't trust what you see you don't trust what mm. you hear you know oh isn't that, yeah isn't that amazing it is. it's amazing and and frustrating and terrifying and yeah the the deep fake video i think is a is going to be a problem uh so it's a huge challenge and i don't know what the answer is i think it'll probably be technological we'll just have to have technology that detects deep fakes better than the deep fake makers make them. Yeah. Uh, and also on the idea of seeing the positive as well as the negative, uh, I mean, I think deep fake videos could be really, you know, there are some parts that'll be amazing about them. Like, you, you know, you can uh, go to a movie and, uh, you know, you can you could have a movie where you and your uh and your spouse are the main characters and they use video from you to like uh they they turn yeah, instead of Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie you can watch yourself go through these adventures on the screen so there there're going to be some cool applications to it but uh but then there are disturbing ones as well yeah I, I agree. And at the same time, I mean, this is my own hypothesis and who knows, Musk could be right. We could all be inside a simulation, but you know, <laughs> I think, I tend to think that this is actually a design, like this is a feature of the universe mm. and that we're creating these technologies that are helping bring to our awareness, you know, things that we weren't previously aware of. And perhaps the answers really are to be found inside of us. And this unreliability on these external sources is, you know, just part of what's a, a, a way sign or a pointer to look within you, dummy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's a really interesting idea because so. I think in, in, it's certainly true that we, sh you know, our senses deceive us a lot, but uh, now that has gone into hyperdrive. So yeah. it's not a new problem in that sense. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, the thing that I read that blew my mind about this, and, and I won't go on too long because I know our time is short, but when I started reading about certain, like even governments, and not even talking about, you know, Russia interfering in American politics, but that there are certain ethnic groups and governments in places in the world that are using social media to stoke violence by posting fake, you know, reports of rapes and assaults and that incite groups to mob action. I was like, no way. That mm. is crazy. It is a huge problem. And it also touches on another problem I'm, I'm obsessed with, which is tribalism. And, uh, and that was the subject of one of my other projects where I tried to show that we're all one big family and that tribalism is a misguided idea. 
Yeah, I, I love that, that we were chatting just briefly before we started recording about that idea. And, and you, cap, you explored that in, in your book, It's All Relative Adventures Up and Down the World's Family Tree. Exactly. Yeah. Trying to create a family tree of the entire human race, which is happening. So people are doing it. Uh, I'm not doing it alone. <laughs> yeah. That would be a lot. But it is a fascinating project. And I'm so glad to, to see the internet being used for good and not just for evil. <laughs> That's exactly right. It is. Yeah, a, yeah it's a tool. That's it's, great. Okay, so before we transition to the final section of the interview, I want to make sure to ask you or share this with you here and ask you um, how readers or listeners can connect with you, learn more about you. Um, what would you have them do if people like what they've heard? They want to know more. Where would you steer them? Well, I would steer them to the aforementioned internet, which can be used for good or evil. So hopefully this would be a good use of it, which is uh, I have a website, ajjacobs.com. Um, and feel free to check it out. Or my Twitter is a, at ajjacobs. And uh, yeah, I would if you're interested, uh, I would love to hear from you. And uh, and if you want a thank you note, send me a note and I'll, uh, I can write you a thank you note. Awesome. I read, I read, maybe you read this too. Walt Disney, he would give, uh, he would give signed uh, photographs if people would send him a self-addressed stamped envelope. But if they asked him for an autograph, he would say, I won't give it to you now, but if you mail me, I will, because he knew so few people actually would. <laughs> <laughs> Very smart of him. Yeah. yeah. In interesting. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to say in, in this part of the interview to make sure that I don't just try to squeeze it in at the very, very end is that as uh, a demonstration of my gratitude to you for sharing your experience and, and things you've learned and your time with me and everyone listening, I've gone on kiva.org and made a micro loan of $100 to an entrepreneur, uh, a, a woman entrepreneur in Ecuador mm. who will use this money to help buy bread, cheese, milk, kitchen utensils to help improve the quality of her life and her family and, and people in her community. So. Just wanted Wonderful. to let you know I did that. I love that. Thank you for that. And I'm a big fan of Kiva. I think they do one, uh, a fantastic job. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. So the last few questions that I want to ask you about here uh, are about creativity, writing, and marketing. Yes. <sighs> Where should we start? You tell me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me ask you, what is the most difficult part of the creative process for you and how do you deal with it? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe I'll answer it by saying my favorite part uh, is coming up with the ideas and because I just love that. And I have a very specific ritual. Uh, I know some people are good at coming up with ideas in the shower or while driving, but for me, I actually try to take 15 minutes, carve it out of my day and say like, you know, at 3.30, I'm going to spend 15 minutes just brainstorming ideas. And they could be book ideas or magazine articles or, or they could just be random. Like I might take a phenomenon, like I might take, what can I do with snowmen that's creative? Maybe I could make a snow non-binary gender person or maybe i could instead of a snowman with a pipe i could give him a, a you know a jewel uh and just these random brain stream of consciousness now the caveat is 99 percent of these ideas are going to suck uh like the ones you just heard but there is always that one percent uh and i do believe strongly that creativity is a numbers game that it's all about coming up with a ton of stuff and a small portion of that stuff is going to be good and resonate and you figure out which part, which those are and you execute on them. So to me, I guess that answers both. That is my favorite part and toughest part is coming up with ideas. And you do that every single day? Well, I pretty, try. Pretty regularly. I try regularly that's a good way to put it um but yeah no i try i try because i think it's so useful and helpful well and what's remarkable to me to hear you say that because a lot of people have ideas and ideas are probably the easy part 
Mm. But the execution and the completion, translating those ideas into reality is where so many of us stumble. But you've done (laughs) an extraordinary job of actually not only getting the books done, but writing great books that people enjoy reading and um, that succeed, it seems to me, at least um, commercially as well. I mean, I understand you have four New York Times bestsellers so far. Yeah, so far, knock on wood. And I think it's a lot is what you said earlier about breaking it down into small uh, portions. So when I write a book, often I'll try to visualize it as just a series of chapters. And because if you just think of it as a book, then uh, at least I get overwhelmed. So I just say, you know what, I'm going to write like these 14 articles and that are around a common theme. And then I can go back and weave them together to make them more tightly knit. But seeing them as many tasks instead of one big task is, it's just so much more, uh, uh, less intimidating. Yeah. That's the, uh, the proverbial elephant one bite at a time, right? (laughs) Delicious. Yes. So how do you, so you have all these ideas, you're very creative. How do you ultimately evaluate which projects you will commit to and what criteria do you use to choose? Yeah, that I think is one of the key questions. And I have a few tests I use. One is I used to be very paranoid and not tell people what my ideas were for fear uh, that they would get stolen, which I think was a, a bit of a self aggrandizing uh, thought. And also, it ignored the benefits of telling people, which are many. They might make improvements, they might suggest tweaks to your idea. And perhaps most important, you can see how enthusiastic they are. So you, t- you know, I tell people an idea and I can, you can tell when their face lights up or you can tell when they're just pretending to be interested. So that telling, telling people uh, as much as possible or even putting it on Facebook, those uh, I think are very effective. And also it's just an inner gauge. Like if I'm, if I'm excited about it, not just the day I come up with it, because that could be deceiving. But a week later, two weeks later, then I'm like, well, maybe I am on. So sort of being aware of your own level of passion. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds wise. <laughs> um, I mean, some people like myself, have, we either don't know what our passions are, or we have many passions, or they're short-lived. But how do you sustain, uh, this assumes that you do, but how do you sustain the motivation required to reach the finish line? Those are, that's a great question. And uh, there are a couple of strategies that come to mind. One is announcing that what you're doing to I mean, being as public about it as possible, because I do think humiliation is a, is a good uh, motivator. So like if I say I'm writing a book about this and then I never write it, people will be what happened? Or, you know, then I'm going to lose five pounds. Just making it public, I think, is, is helpful. Uh, I also try, uh, I find it very motivating, the idea that the, and this again may be self-aggrandizing, but that my books might help people. So for the gratitude book, for instance, you know, I'm like, you know, this is actually a, a, a message that helped me and it could help the people who read this book. So I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm actually, uh, you know, this is like a, a social good I'm doing and I'm trying to make the world better. And that can be very motivating. Um, so I guess those are two that I use. Oh, I love that. And in fact, in my research, my reading, um, recently I came across this distinction I love that's right in line with what you've said. Um, this teacher, Nisar Gadatta, says he distinguishes between activity and work, saying activity is merely for oneself, where work is for the whole. Mm, and I like that. I, and so this idea that when you're working and it's greater than just you, then it has a different quality and perhaps ability to help you stay with it and see it through. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So, okay, tell me, if, if you will, about the role that luck has played 
in your success and about the letter you addressed to agent at ICM. <laughs> yeah, this was a point I made in my gratitude book that I thank my lucky stars. I believe that I have been incredibly lucky. I've been lucky in where I've been born in a developed nation to parents who, uh, who are loving. And uh, I've been lucky in that, uh, uh, you know, my books, I do think they're good, but there are people, I hard to say, but I'd say they're like, you know, every week, the week my first book came out, there were probably 10 books that came out that were as good, if not better than mine, that just sold like 10 copies. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with luck uh, and just being at the right place at the right time. The fact that, you know, a producer at uh, at Good Morning America was in a, a good mood when they received my book and like, oh, this could make a fun segment and that I got on TV. And uh, the same with uh, my, my, my very first book was like a random novelty humor, short humor book about uh, Elvis Presley. And uh, I sent it out. I sent the proposal out to dozens of agents. I had no connections. And it happened to land on the desk of a, an Elvis fan who thought that it would be a fun book. And if it had landed on the desk of if this guy had happened to have been a Bruce Springsteen fan instead of an Elvis fan, you know, I might be doing something totally different for a living. That's amazing. It's totally amazing. What have you learned about successfully pitching books? Hmm. Um, I would say uh, a few things. One is trying to think of it from the perspective of the reader. So, you know, you may be fascinated with something, but uh, you've got to ask, how is this going to help the reader's life? How, and that, because that's the what the editor is going to ask before they buy your manuscript. You know, how who is this for? How is it going to help them? Uh, so that's one uh, part of it. Another part is like starting strong. You want if you send write a book proposal, like make that first paragraph so uh, grabbing and hard to resist that the editor has to keep reading because they get so many submissions that if you don't grab them in the first few sentences, then they're just going to move on to the next. And by the way, is that in the manuscript or in, because I know many, um, many publishing houses want some kind of either a cover letter or they have their own questions they want you to respond to. Are you, are you just saying from whatever the first thing they read is or the first part of the work itself? I'd or? say both. I would say both. I mean, at least for nonfiction, I don't know fiction as well. In nonfiction, you sort of have a cover letter saying, "Here, here's what my book is about, um, you know, let me introduce myself. Then you have an outline or proposal. Sometimes people send the whole book. But I would say in both that cover letter and in the outline uh, proposal, make the starts of it as compelling as possible. Yeah. And then when it comes to, to marketing, um, I know for many people, uh, many aspiring authors, you know, marketing is something someone else will take care of someday, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, exactly. And I've also learned that, you know, it seems to be pretty sound advice for people who are commercially successful, which as we know is a single digit percentage of all writers, <laughs> that marketing is something you've got to be thinking of from the, the moment you start thinking of the book itself. Absolutely. And I, uh, I have had to change my mind over the years about marketing because just what, what you said, that's the way I felt in the beginning. Oh, let someone else do it. But now I'm like, if I don't do it, a lot of it's not going to get done. So I've had to reframe it as what I, I try to think of it as a, um, as a creative endeavor. You know, a lot of people think, oh, marketing, that's so boring and that's business like, but instead apply your creativity as an artist to the marketing and think in creative ways. I remember I wrote a book about the Bible, uh, following all the rules of the Bible. And uh, I was like, I want to, I don't want just uh, book publications to write about this. I want to get it out everywhere. So 
I had a friend who worked at Glamour magazine, and I was like, well, what if I wrote about sex, sex advice from the Bible for Glamour? Because uh, there are some racy parts in the Bible. And she's like, yeah, that could be funny. So I wrote that, and you know, that had, at the time, a reach of 5 million people. So think of, uh, think of your marketing as, as being creative, not as a chore. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Okay, so last last thing on that topic and then and then we'll go ahead and wrap up um when it comes to to marketing a book i mean it's one thing to have these these ideas you know and these intentions but right. it's another to to make them you know cohesive to select quality ones because as has been said before you know we can do just about anything but we can't do everything, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> do you, do you create um, a marketing plan for your books or do you just take like a few ideas and see those through or how do you, how do you approach that? Uh, I probably should be more organized than I am, but I'm relatively organized in that I write down, um, I, I basically do a bunch of those 15 minute brainstorming sessions. So I will come up with, one session might be devoted to what are all the different outlets that all the different magazines or websites or TV shows that I could go on that might have some interest. So, you know, for the Bible, it was the traditional, like Fresh Air on NPR, but also you want to think of the more unusual ones. Like I said, Glamour, or I wrote for a music magazine about the you know, history of biblical music. Uh, so, that's one session devote to all the different um, uh, all the different places you could pitch to. Uh, I did another brainstorming session on what are like the ten big ideas in my book that uh, that could. But well, what are the ten sort of self help ideas? Uh, what are another session might be on what are what are the news hooks? What is it? How does it relate to the world? Uh, you know, like maybe uh, the Bible talked about adultery, and we have a uh, uh, a, a president who uh, who has committed adultery. So is that a news hook? So all sorts of different ways uh, uh, of different brainstorming sessions, um, and then you've got all these lists, and you can start filling them out. And I'm not as good at spreadsheets as my wife. Uh, but if I were good, I would use those. Well, you, you're doing something right. So what, whatever you're doing, <laughs> keep it up. It's working. So, well, thank you, right. Brian. And yeah. uh, I love talking to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education or who live in conflict zones. There's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at briamiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.